Well, hello, New Orleans. It's so good to be back here with you. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And uh, we're going to start reading uh, here in just a moment. Uh, well, can't get the page to turn the way I want it to, but we're going to start reading in just a moment uh, in verse 27 of Luke, chapter 12. And I want to say to President Dew how thankful I am for the invitation to come back to New Orleans. I also told my church when we were considering the whole idea of the presidency of the SBC and trying to manage schedule, I said, now I've got these seminaries that I'm going to be preaching at, but none of them are going to have me back twice in the same year. So this is just going to be uh, six times and then that'll be it. And then you broke the mold and invited me to come back. And, um, you know, I think I might naturally have been inclined to say, no, I need to, you know, not be gone away so much. But the last time I was here, right after I finished preaching, they fed me Miss Alice's red beans and rice. And so it was kind of Pavlovian. He invited me to come back and my mouth started watering and I said yes before I even knew uh, that I had said anything. And, uh, and it was the right decision. I'm very thankful to be here with you today and on Serve Day. What an amazing day to spend time with the folks here at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word as we read, uh, starting in verse 27 of Luke chapter 12. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Did y'all like that part? I'm not preaching about any of that. I just wanted you to get kind of a lead in to the part that I'm actually gonna preach about, okay? So here it is. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the truth and power of teachings from your lips to your disciples, recorded, preserved down through the years, translated, and brought to us, your disciples, in a different day, in a different place, in a different context, but with the same mission and the same ambition. So this is helpful to us that you've given us this word today. Help us to do more than read it, to do more than hear it. May it change us for having encountered it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Now you're wondering why I read like 10 verses that are not in the sermon today, and I'll tell you why I'm doing that. It's because as I get to preaching this, some of you are gonna think, now wait a minute, you're preaching about servanthood from a passage that's really about eschatology. And I want you to understand that servanthood is eschatological and theological. And it's something that arises out of our faith. Because when you read what Jesus has to say about laying up treasures in the, in the kingdom of heaven, when you hear him talking about how 
Uh, we should be people who trust in God and have faith in God to provide for us here and now and also later in eternity. The examples he gives of that are examples that involve our not being selfish, our not clinging to things as though our only hope is in taking care of ourselves in this life. Instead, what he says is, if you really believe and you trust in what's going to happen at the end, feel free to sell all your possessions. Feel free to give to charity. Feel free to invest in serving God and serving others. The theme verse for this year for the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting is 2 Corinthians 4, 5, which says, we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. And so here in Luke chapter 12, we have Jesus talking about that, talking about the idea of out of our faith, adopting a posture of servanthood instead of selfishness. And the culmination of that, I think, is in the illustration that he gives in verses 35, 36, 37, and 38. And I want us to look carefully at that to learn what it is to serve with heaven in mind. Let's look first of all at what it says in verse 35 where it says, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Uh, that's actually the phrase that uh, King James guy grew up, King James like me, uh, would, know, would recognize as being the gird your loins uh, verb that you see uh, over and over again uh, mentioned in the, in the New Testament. And what it's talking about there, the New Testament and the Old, what it's talking about there is adjusting your dress in such a way that you are ready to work. In other words, what he's saying is that they should be prepared. They need to be prepared to work. And so the first thing I want to share with you is this. Service is a project to be worked. It's something that you have to prepare to do to serve other people. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be prepared to work. I was just uh, a few days ago in Little Rock, Arkansas in the aftermath of the tornadoes that went through that area. And as I was there talking to local pastors and talking to disaster relief workers and uh, talking to people who were engaged in that response and talking to some of the people whose homes had been blown away, uh, a television reporter came up and wanted to talk to me. And so um, I said, well, you should really talk to them. They were the survivors who survived this. So they did. They did an interview with the, with the lady whose house had been blown away. But then eventually they came and said, now we want to talk to you. And I said, okay, all right, that's fine. So I was doing the interview. Here was the first question that they asked. They said, how did it happen that Southern Baptists sent all these people to help after this tornado right after it happened? And I said, well, it was no coincidence. The fact of the matter is everyone you see here who's wearing a yellow hat and a yellow jacket. They didn't know that a tornado was going to hit Little Rock on this day, but they knew somebody would need them sometime. And so they all prepared weeks ago, months ago, years ago, went through training. And every time you have a disaster, there are a lot of people who, what they call them are SUVs, spontaneous unsolicited volunteers. People who just show up. And listen, uh, an SUV in an SUV is what you're likely to get in Texas. A spontaneous, unsolicited volunteer in a sport utility vehicle. And uh, a Louisiana or a Texan or an Arkansan or whatever uh, with a truck or a Suburban and a chainsaw and some duct tape and bailing wire can get a whole lot done. Uh, but the people who get the most done at disaster sites are the people who prepared beforehand to know exactly what to do and how to do it, to serve people, to minister to them. There has never been a moment that anybody did more preaching to the choir than I'm doing right now because you're here. You're here where you can prepare here and then serve anywhere. You're here getting ready 
to be able to serve the Lord. But that's, listen, you're not just getting ready to be able to serve the Lord, you're getting ready to get other people ready to serve the Lord too, so that we're all in a posture of having our loins girded about. And, but don't say it that way. And, uh, and, we're, and we're ready, we've made preparation, and that's what he's saying, it, it, that you should be people who aren't just kind of coasting through life, but instead, you've made necessary preparation to be serving here and investing in eternity. Now, so it's a, so it's a project to be worked and prepared for. It's, it's the kind of thing that requires planning and training and execution. The second thing that he says here is that it is an attitude to be adopted or imitated. He says that, that they're somebody you should be like. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Be, be like people who have their focus on the needs of their master, on the desires of their master. So I've got a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old, and I knew that there was a glorious time coming in my life and we had little children when we would have children who would be able to do so much more than they were able to do when they were younger. And I looked forward to the teenage years what I did not anticipate was that the day would come when they stayed up later than I like to stay up and that I would have to stay up to wait on them to come home. And I want to tell you that I don't like it at all, not one little bit. In fact, I find that when my son asks, what time should I be home, or when my daughter asks, what time should I be home, that at five or six o'clock in the afternoon, I may say, well, you're driving out to this place, you need to be back at 10.30. And that feels like a good answer at that moment. But at 9.30, it doesn't feel like that at all. And I get more angry with every passing moment that I'm not able to go to bed. And so there's some sacrifice made, but, but you see, the reason that I keep staying up is because I want to make sure that if my son or my daughter needs me, that I'm ready. It's not about me, it's about them. And when that mindset comes into our lives, we are ready to be the kind of servants who are investing in eternity through the service that we're giving. And really, it's, a, it's an attitude change that can happen just like that. How many of you know that I have a cow named Lottie Moon? Some of you do. Okay. You want to hear something about Lottie Moon? The cow, not the missionary. So I'll tell you, and if you follow, follow me on social media, you may know this. Yesterday, she had her first calf. She had a little baby girl calf. I'm going to be quiet until you clap. There you go. Thank you. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. She had a baby. She had a baby. She had a baby. Here's the thing. She's like a pet, okay? I go out there. She follows me around. She wants to be scratched. She wants to be fed. She wants attention all the time. Yesterday morning, before we drove to come here, we were going out to take care of them and feed them before we were leaving to come to New Orleans. We came out and we found that just a matter of minutes before we got there, she had given birth to a calf. And I thought, hey, that's worth a reward. And so I went and got a bucket of, of sweet feed, the kind of thing that she would normally kill for. And I walked up to her with that bucket. And she looked at me with the most severe side eye that I've ever seen. And she smelled the bucket of food. And then she lowered her head and started butting in my direction and wanted nothing to do with me nothing to do with the food because in moments she had changed from a heifer who was taking care of herself to a cow who was taking care of her baby above everything else. 
in a moment, God can move your focus off of yourself and on to others. And it changes the way you behave. And so, it's an attitude that we find in Philippians, uh, don't we? Where it tells us that there's a mind that was in Christ Jesus, an attitude that was in Christ Jesus that's supposed to be in us as, as well. It's a mind in which we value other people above ourselves. It's in which we value the Lord and his interests above ourselves. It's something where we put ourselves in the back seat. And that attitude, we prepare to do the work, but we have to have the attitude that delights in and glories in serving others. That Chick-fil-A, it's my pleasure attitude applied to our service for the Lord where we serve others for Christ's sake. So it's a project to be worked. It's an attitude to be adopted. Um, so thirdly, it's an, it's an opportunity to be watching for. Look at what he says here in verse 37. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. So that we are alert in watching for the second coming of Christ. But what, what it means to be alert for this and watching for the second coming of Christ is not that you have a book full of charts and that you're looking, you know, like, like we did eschatology when I was younger. Listen, I'm not throwing shade because I'm, I'm a dispensationalist myself, but I'm just saying I knew some folks who the way they did eschatology was, with, they said, with the book of Revelation in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And they're, they're, all they wanted to do was predict dates and give all sorts of, of information that God deliberately did not give us about when the second coming was going to happen, okay? The way to be on alert for the coming of Christ is not to be all the time with your nose buried in the book of Revelation trying to make out charts and predict dates and do stuff like that. The way to be alert for the second coming of Christ is to be busy about serving Christ in the work that he gave us to do while we're anticipating his return. It's the service of the kingdom of heaven while we await the returning king. And so that's what he means here, where he says these, these slaves who are on the alert when he comes, he's talking about disciples who have stayed attuned to the kingdom of heaven instead of the needs of here to serve him faithfully. Alert to all of the opportunities that come to serve God. You had your ear open for an opportunity to serve God when he called you to come here and study. You'll have your ears open for opportunities to serve God when you graduate and he calls you from here to, to serve somewhere else. And you also have your ears open for opportunities to serve God while you are here in ways beyond studying. To serve God by going out on serve day. To serve God by being engaged in the work of a local church in this area while you're studying whether on staff and leadership or as a member. If you want to be a good church leader someday, be a good church member today. And learn what it means to serve within the body of Christ. All of these are things that show that we are daily focused in on the movement and work of the kingdom of God. The last thing I want to share with you is this. In addition to all the other things that it is, servanthood that invests in eternity is a blessing to be desired. Look at what he says. In verse 37, he starts the first time, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. He says, also, again, down in verse 38, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them, blessed are those slaves. But in between those two places where he just pronounces the word blessing, he describes the blessing. It's really poignant because in Luke chapter 17, you have another place where Jesus is speaking and he says, none of you, if you have a servant who's been out working, he comes in at the end of the day, none of you say to him, hey, listen, you've been working hard. Come over here, lay down. 
let me get you some food. I'm going to take care of you. None of you would do that. Instead, what you would do is you would look and say, all right, great, fix me something to eat. Come in here and serve me. I've been working hard all day. Well, I know you have, but I'm the master. And you owe me your service, and it's your job to come serve me. And so Jesus in Luke 17 says, no master ever does this where he takes the one who who, who is the slave, who's the servant, and says, here, let me take care of you. Let me feed you. Let me me give you some rest and peace and ease at the end of a hard day's labor. And here in Luke chapter 13, Jesus promises that he's going to do the very thing he said no human master ever does. Look what he says. He says, He says, here's what's going to happen. That that master, when he finds those slaves on the alert, he's going to gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and come up and wait on them. Jesus models for us what it is to serve, doesn't he? After all, with his own closest followers... He took up the towel in the basin and made himself their servant. So much so that Peter couldn't handle the emotion of it all. The idea that Jesus would lower himself in this way. Today, many of you will go out to serve in the name of Jesus You're going to encounter people whose lives have been broken by running away from Jesus or by the actions of other people. But in some cases, you're going to be tempted to look and say, your situation is really at least partially your fault, bruh. (laughs) You're going to go out and you're going to share the gospel. And some of the people that you share the gospel with are going to be interested and kind and attentive. And some of them are going to make fun of you or turn their back to you or say unkind things to you. And because you're human and because you have an adversary who tempts you, You may have a moment where you think, you are not worthy of my service. Why am I using my time to do something for you? But you will enter the banquet hall of heaven. having escaped consequences of sin that was your fault. You will enter the banquet hall of heaven like Peter, having at one time been in rebellion against the very one who feeds you and serves you. And Jesus has said, That if you want to invest in eternity and be great in the kingdom of heaven that day, the pathway is to be like your master and to become the servant of all and to empty yourself out for people who don't deserve it. Don't just keep that in mind today. Let us resolve to hide it in our hearts and to let it shape our lives. Will you pray with me? Father, we give thanks to you, the great Savior of mankind, the one who
one willing to relinquish the treasures and joys and comforts of heaven to give yourself up as a ransom for us. Make us citizens of heaven even while we are living here. And give us the hearts of servants. And when you come back, may it be soon. Grant us the blessing of being found just like that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.